So hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the first uh, seminar of uh, 2021. Uh, today's talk is by Akbar Rakhi uh, of uh, Simon Fraser University on the complexity of CSB-based uh, ideal membership problem. Yeah, thank you. Right, so as Jakub said, I will be talking about uh, the complexity of CSB-based ideal membership problem. And this is based on joint work with Andre Blotto. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with uh, some definitions to like uh, state, uh, state the problem. So let me start off with uh, what, do, what do we mean by ideals and some like, like introduction to this uh, algebraic geometric stuff. So through this talk, let F be a field. For instance, a field of complex number or real numbers. And then by f x1 to xn, we denote the ring of polynomials over f, or, or maybe often I use f uh, capital X. Uh, and then an ideal is a subset of uh, this uh, ring of polynomials, basically a set of polynomials that satisfies three properties. So the first one is zero belongs to the ideal. The second property is that the ideal is closed on the uh, addition. So if you have f and g in the ideal and then you sum them up, the result is also a polynomial in the ideal. And then the third property is uh, sort of the ideal is absorbing the multiplication. So if you have uh, this polynomial f in the ideal and then another polynomial h uh, from the ring of polynomials and then you multiply them, you get something in the ideal. So it has these three properties. Let's see an example of ideal. So let's say we have uh, these polynomials, f1 to fm, in the ring of polynomials. So we define this subset, which is basically the summation of hi, fi, where hi's are from ring of polynomials. So this gives us a set of polynomials, like sort of generated by this f1 to fm, right? So you can check that this set, the way it is constructed, satisfies the three uh, properties of an ideal. Right? So this set is basically an ideal and it is called the ideal generated by F1 to Fm. Okay. Uh, for instance, so let's say uh, I have polynomial one, so basically a polynomial of degree zero. So the ideal generated by this polynomial is basically the entire ring of polynomials. So as, as, uh, as long as you have one in the generator set, then you get the whole ring of polynomials, right? Uh, so there is this uh, fundamental theorem by Hilbert called like Hilbert basis theorem, which says every ideal uh, of the ring of polynomials has a finite generating set. So this generating set is not unique, it's not unique, but uh, it's, uh, we have a finite generating set. So this gives us a way of representing ideals, right? So let's let's get to the definition of ideal membership problem. So the input of this uh, problem is uh, an ideal and another polynomial f. And the question is, does f belong to i? So we wanna check if the input polynomial f belongs to the ideal, right? And as I said, this ideal i is represented to us by its generators, like f1 to fm, and just to remind you the definition, if we have these generators, then the idea is going to be set of these polynomials, right? All right, okay. Uh, so in a more like a stronger version of this problem, uh, so basically the search version of this problem, we have this input polynomial F and then this generating polynomial F1 to Fm, and now the question is, does there exist H1 to Hm such that the equality holds? So basically you can generate F using this uh, multiplicative polynomials H1 to Hm and the generating polynomials, right? And uh, so we want to find such H1 to Hm from the ring of polynomials such that the equality holds. And uh, this H1 to Hm are called Nullstellung that proved of the fact that f is inside the ideal, right? 
that give you a couple of seconds to stir this and digest it. Right. Okay. So how do people generally like attack this type of problems? So like this, the basically for the search version, when you want to find those proof, nullish length of proofs, H1 to HM. So basically the first thing that comes to mind is like start dividing, do polynomial division, right? So we have this input polynomial F and then this generators F1 to FM. And then if you start dividing F by this F1 to FM, we get the remainder, right? And if the remainder is zero, then we can say that the, the polynomial, the input polynomial F belongs to the idea, okay? But uh, we may not be lucky and the remainder may not be zero, right? In that case, we cannot say anything for sure. We cannot say F is not in the ideal, right? Why is that? Because the order of division matters, right? The, the way that we divide this input polynomial by this generating polynomial, it matters, right? So let me elaborate on that by an example. So for instance, let's say this input polynomial is F, X squared Y minus X Y squared plus Y, just a simple polynomial. And then my generating polynomials are F1 equals X squared and F2 is X Y minus one. Then the ideal uh, I'm looking at is generated by F1 and F2. All right, so now let's start dividing F by F2, right? If you start dividing F by F2 first, then we get this result, which says F equals zero F1 plus something times F2, and the remainder is minus X, right? But if we start dividing by F1 first, and then divide by F2 after that, we get remainder zero, okay? So what, what the point that I wanna make here is that uh, this generator set, this generator set of uh, ideal, they may not be well behaved in terms of division. So if you are if you are unlucky and you get the non-zero remainder, then you cannot say for sure that the polynomial is not in the ideal, right? So this is like basically the beginning of the story of uh, Grobner bases, where people are where people are interested in finding sort of good generators, right? So well now the more robust approach to solve this uh, search version of ideal membership problem is to construct Grobner bases of the ideals, whatever they are. So the good property of this Grobner bases, basically they are generators of the ideal and they are pretty well behaved in terms of uh, polynomial division, right? So basically the most important property of this Grobner bases is that the remainder is unique, no matter in what order we do division, okay? Uh, and uh, so in order to solve the IMP problem, what we do, we have this uh, ideal with its generating polynomials, then from those we construct Grobner bases, and then as soon as we have the Grobner bases, we do division, polynomial division, as long as we can in any order we want, and if the, the, the remainder is zero, if and only if the polynomial is in the ideal, all right? Yeah, but life is not that simple. We, there, there are some drawbacks here. So first of all, these Grobner bases are very sensitive to monomial ordering. So whenever we talk about polynomials or polynomial division, we have to set, fix the monomial order. For instance, lexicographic ordering or graded lexicographic, right? And if you change the ordering that we are working with, you see like drastic changes in the complexity of construction, constructing Grobner bases. And we will see that this uh, monomial orders, we don't like them in terms of CSV later on in the talk. And another drawback is that, uh, so there is this general algorithm called Buchberger's algorithm for constructing Grobner bases. So this algorithm is sort of, uh, non-deterministic, and it is quite tedious to analyze the complexity of Grobner, uh, Buchberger's algorithm, uh, which construct Grobner bases. So, well, there are some upper bound and lower bounds for the, sorry, upper bounds for the complexity of uh, 
it's Bookberger's algorithm. But uh, it's uh, quite tedious to analyze this uh, algorithm and see for your specific problem which you are interested in. Is it going to give you a polynomial time algorithm to construct group bases or not? Okay. So this was uh, about search version. Now let's go to the decision version of problem, which we are not interested in finding uh, those proofs, H1 and HM, H1 to HM. And we, we are just interested to say yes or no. The, the polynomial is in the ideal or not. Right? So here we are interested in the geometry of variety. All right. Let me define what a variety is. So a variety of an ideal is basically the set of all zeros of polynomials inside the ideal, right? So it's a subset of Fn, right? Uh, where F is your field, and this uh, variety is basically the set of all zeros of polynomials. Okay. Uh, so this by strong Müller-Stenzad, we can say that uh, we can say the following: every F every polynomial in the ring of polynomials that vanishes at every point of the variety belongs to the ideal. So if you have a representation of the points in the variety and you can check, evaluate the polynomials, the input polynomial F on those points, and for all of them you get zero, then you can say the, this polynomial F belongs to the variety, okay? So for instance, if the ideal is generated by one, basically the ideal is the entire set of uh, uh, the, the entire ring of polynomials, then the variety is the empty set, right? So basically all the polynomials are inside the uh, ring of polynomials, which is obvious, right? So I have put this radical condition in brackets. So in order to, there are some technicalities here. So in order to be able to apply this strong knowledge, we need the ideal to be radical, whatever that means. But we will see the way that we construct the ideals for CSP problem, they automatically will be radical. So we can apply this strong knowledge, okay? And yeah, so we have these two theorems, which are like weak and strong knowledge, and these are basically, what I said is basically the intuition of these two theorems, all right. Uh, so let's see an example of uh, some combinatorialized ideal. So what are the two examples? Let's say I want to two color a triangle. So I have this triangle X, Y, Z, and I want to two color the vertices of this triangle. Okay. And the colors that I have are zero, one, let's say. So first of all, this vertex X, it can have only two colors. Right. So I have this polynomial equation which says, okay, x times x minus 1 is 0. So forcing x to be 0 or 1. And for simplicity, let's say you are working in, uh, in real numbers. Right. So we have the same uh, polynomial equation for y, which forces the image of y to be 0 or 1. And the same thing for z. All right. And now we have a set of constraints, which says basically, well, uh, I want different color for, for the edges, right? So adjacent vertices get different colors. All right. So I need to encode this using polynomials. So I have this polynomial which says, okay, x plus y minus one equals zero. So because I have this edge, x, y, then I want them to have different colors. The same thing for y, z, h. I want them to have different colors. And the last edge is uh, X and Y, uh, sorry, Z and X. All right. So now I have this domain constraint, basically, this domain polynomials and this H constraint, this H polynomial. Now we can say this graph is two colorable if and only if the polynomial system that I explained here has a solution. Okay. If you find a satisfying assignment for these polynomials, then you have a two colorable. You have a two color. But we know that the graph is not two colorable, right? All right. Let me continue. And okay, let me rephrase this problem in terms of ideal membership problem. So first, I generate this ideal, which contains all the polynomials 
uh, from the previous slide at its generators. Okay. Then uh, the graph from the previous slide has a has no two coloring, if and only if one belongs to the ideal. Basically, the variety of the ideal is empty. Well, we can say that you can see that you can express one using this polynomial. And yeah, so one is in the ideal, which implies the variety is an empty set. So there you go, no two color. All right. So let's see some application. So this uh, ideal membership problem is like, has been studied for a long time in like between mathematicians and uh, well, they have done like, quite a amazing job. But recently we have, uh, so this ideal membership problem has uh, some applications in computer science for CS people, right? So for instance, this ideal membership problem can be uh, can be used as a proof system, meaning that uh, uh, as we saw in the case of two coloring, uh, you can formulate your problem such that it witness uh, that an instance has no solution. Okay, as we did it before, what we what we do is we encode our problems through some polynomials, f1 to fn, and then check if one belongs to the ideal. If one is in the ideal, then no solution. And if uh, otherwise, there is a solution. And in the more in more strong sense, we want to find these proofs that are witnessing that one is in the ideal. Okay? So basically this null proof. And in the proof complexity, people are interested in the size of the smallest proof that you can find, basically. Well, the, the size constraint could be like a degree constraint or maybe number of number of monomials that you wanna use. All right. So let's see another uh, application of this ideal membership problem, sort of in terms of optimization. So let's say we want to minimize this polynomial, R of, x1 to xn subject to some polynomial constraints. So my polynomial constraints are as follows. P1 of x1 to xn is equal zero and up to PL, right? So an SOS, sum of a square certificate of a lower bound for this polynomial. So let's say we want to prove that this polynomial, certify that this polynomial are, is at least theta. So what do we do? We write this R minus theta as a sum of a square polynomial. So this is always positive because uh, it's a sum of a square polynomial. And then the ideal membership part, right? So this part is zero for an assignment which satisfies all this system of polynomials. So this term is zero and this term is always positive. So the whole thing witnesses that R is at least theta, okay? And well, the degree of this sum of a square certificate is basically maximum of degree of this guy that you have here and maximum of degree of this guy you have here, right? All right, uh, so this way we can prove like non-negativity. We can uh, define non-negativity of a polynomial. So let's say we have this set of polynomials as before, P1 to PL. And then we say this polynomial S as a sum of a square proof of non-negativity from P, if we can have this equality. So the same as before. This term is always positive because we have sum of squares, and this term is always zero, so the whole thing is positive. So we have a proof of non-negativity of F. All right. Uh, so, well, the main appeal of this SOS proof systems, or basically this SOS certificate of non-negativity, is that uh, uh, we can, we can, the existence of a degree D SOS certificate can be, uh, can be sort of formulated as a visibility of semi-definite program, right? So this, this inside this semi-definite program, you have these monomials, if you have a bounded degree, you have these monomials, and then you are trying to find coefficients for these monomials, right? And if you have bounded degree, the number of monomials that you have to consider is bounded. So then you have a like bounded size 
semi-definite program and you try to find the coefficients, right? Uh, and there was uh, this common misconception that if you have a uh, sum of a square, which is uh, of low degree, if you know the existence of a low degree sum of square, then you can find it. Basically, SOS is degree automatable, right? So yeah, as I said, it means like if you have a low degree SOS deviation, then you can find it. So basically this SDP can be solved efficiently, right? But it turns out this is not the case. And basically this sum, this sum of the squares are not degree automatable. And uh, this is due to O'Donnell in 2017. He came up with a counterexample which says, this is not the case and we need some extra condition for SOS to be automatable, right? And those extra conditions are that uh, not only we need this low degree condition, we also need to have uh, some bound on the coefficients of, of the polynomials that we are using. So let's say the ellipsoid method is gonna solve the SDP, right? And it turns out these conditions that we are looking for can be, <coughs> can be satisfied provided that the IMP part of the problem is polynomial time solvable. So if you can solve the IMP part, uh, then you can get the automatable SOS proof, right? And this is due to Ravavandra and Bynes in 2017. All right, so we have seen some applications. We saw the definition and example and some applications. Now let's go to the uh, IMP problems coming from CSP. All right, so in CSP, we have this instance P, and which is the instance of CSP of A, where A is a relational structure with some base set, let's say, we, we denote it by D, basically the domain, zero to R minus one. And then uh, in the variables, let's say they are X1 to Xn. And we have some set of constraints, let's say, where, and each constraint yeah, has a set of uh, positive set of variables and uh, sort of the relation coming from this relational structure, right? So now let's say we want to encode this problem in terms of uh, ideal membership problem, right? So for every constraint that we have in the instance, we introduce a polynomial F sub C, which is on those variables inside the constraint. I want to, uh, X I want to, X I K. And the zeros of this polynomial are exactly the tuples from R. So sort of what we did in the, in the two in two coloring example, right? Furthermore, for every variable, we introduce this domain polynomial, right? So I want every variable to get a value from this set, right? So we have a polynomial of degree R, which, in, which forces uh, this Xi to get a value from this set, all right? So as soon as we have these uh, polynomials, we put these polynomials together and generate an ideal. So put all these polynomials together and it gives us an ideal, which corresponds to this uh, instance of CSPA. Okay. All right. So ideal membership with respect to a relational structure. Let me define the problem. So input is a CSP instance, P of CSPA, where A is a relational structure with some variables, x1 to xn, and we have this input polynomial f. So we construct the corresponding ideal to the instance, ip, and the question is whether this f belongs to this ideal, okay? And well, also find proofs if it's possible. And we have a, a like sort of a, easier version of this problem where we uh, enforce the degree, we bound the degree of input polynomial. So this polynomial F, we say, okay, let's let it have at most degree at most D. This problem is denoted by ideal membership of D A. Okay. All right. So, well, remember at the beginning of talk when I was talking about the, this null students that stuff, I was saying, okay, we need the idea to be radical, to be able to apply this uh, Nullish-Tillensat theorem, right? 
so since we, we are adding all these domain polynomials, then the idea we are generating is always radical. So we are good in that sense. We can apply this knowledge to Linda. So hence we have an equivalent formulation of ideal membership problem, right? Okay. So in this equivalent formulation, again, we have this instance P of CSPA. A is a relational structure with some variables and this polynomial, which is coming from ring of polynomials. And now the question is, is every solution of this instance, the CSP instance, a zero of F? Okay. And if every solution of this CSP instance is a zero of F, so basically you take this solution, you plug it into F and evaluate F in, 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 on that solution. If you get a zero for all of them, then you can say f belongs to the ideal, right? So here is somehow motivating to work with these varieties instead of like working with the, uh, those Grobner bases, right? And in, well, in CSV, we like these varieties, right? We are more comfortable with these varieties. So as a corollary, if we, this ideal membership is co-MP, uh, is, is in co-MP, meaning that so. It, you can verify the no instance. So I give you a solution to my CSP, plug it in in the polynomial and it gives you non-zero, which is a no. So you can uh, verify this no instance in polynomial time. So IMP is co-MP, is in co-MP, right? All right, so some research questions. Uh, so the first question is that, uh, we have this relational structure A, and can we construct Grobner bases for any instance of uh, this ideal membership problem? So let's say P is an instance of CSP A. So can you find the Grobner bases for IP, the ideal of uh, the corresponding to that CSP instance? The second question, so if we have this one, if we construct Grobner bases, we can solve the search version, obviously the decision version. The second question is that uh, for which relational structure uh, we have small knowledge to of proofs of the fact that F belongs to the ideal. Okay, this is uh, another question. And third question, for which relational structure the problem IMPA or IMP sub DA, a restricted version is polynomial time soluble. Okay. So now we are slowly getting to the, studying the geometry and basically the operations of these relational structures, all sort of polymorphism. All right, so let's see what we know so far. So in the Boolean case, we have a dichotomy, which classifies all the cases. And it is as follows. It's almost the same as uh, Schiffer's dichotomy. But, uh, so let me get to the details. So in 2019, uh, Monaldo, Mastro Alili started to study this problem in a way that CSP people like. So uh, I study basically the properties of this relational structure. And uh, he, he proved the following. So if A has a majority polymorphism, then IMP of A is polytime. Okay, so well in Booleans, when we have majority polymorphism, basically the instances are two set instances, right? And the proof was that uh, a Grobner basis of this instance, if we have majority polymorphism, they have degree at most two and they have good coefficients, right? So what we do, we enumerate over all this degree two polynomial, right? And we have, uh, and we have the uh, we have our Grobner basis, okay. So this was for majority uh, majority polymorphism. And the second result is as follows: If we have a semi-lattice polymorphism, then IMP sub D of A is polynomial time for any D. So just note that in the majority case we don't have any degree restriction on the input polynomial, but in the semi-lattice case we have this degree restriction. All right. So what is the proof idea? So when we have semi-lattice polymorphism, 
for this uh, over booleans, then the instances are anti or anti homestead or homestead instances, right? Depending if you have max or min. Anyway, so then uh, it turns out the Grobner bases include only binomial polynomials. So polynomials including only two monomials, right? And then they have good coefficients. All right. So if you have this bounded degree, uh, if if you if you have this bound on the degree of input polynomial, then you can enumerate over all these binomial polynomials and get the, your Grobner braces, right? In time n to the d. Okay. So uh, that's why we have this degree restriction for in the simulated case. Now the other remaining case is the affine case. So basically, uh, the result is due to Monster Lili and Baharati, and they say if we have affine polymorphism, if we have an affine polymorphism, then the IMP again we have this degree restriction on the input. It's polynomial time for any d. All right. So in this case, if we have affine polymorphism, it means the instance is a linear equation mod two. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it's mod two instance, and then so this case, in my opinion, was like the most difficult case, and so basically we have these linear equations mod two. Then we need to lift them to have polynomials over real, but this lifting is not always polynomial times uh, is not always efficient to do it in polynomial time. So we need to come up with some tricks. All right. Uh, I uh, I'm gonna skip the details of it. so it's like uh, more tedious than the the other cases. All right, and uh, the on the hardness result. So unlike the Shepherd's dichotomy, if we have uh, this constant operations or basically this constant relations, the problem is co-empty complete, right? So IMP two of uh, A is co-empty complete, and the reason that we have this two here because we only have uh, two constants, like zero and one in Boolean. So if you wanna have a polynomial that represents both of them, sort of speaking, then you need this degree two here, okay? All right, <clears throat> so this was uh, what we know about this Boolean case. Now we are interested in to like uh, have a like, higher level look at the problem and see if we want to extend results to higher domain or if we can, <clears throat> like part of these tools that have been developed in CSP for the dichotomy theorem and use them here for this ideal membership problem. Okay, so let's start with something easy. <clears throat> we, wanted to, we want to check if we can expand the relational structure that we have by constant, okay? Does, does that change the complexity of problem or not? All right, so let's uh, AC denote the structure A where with the, the denote the structure A with some added constant relations, all right? All right, so we have this theorem which says, okay, if you add this constant relation, it doesn't change the complexity of the problem. So basically, IMP of AC is polytime time reducible to IMP of A with a blow up in the degree, right? And this blow up in the degree is, coming from the fact that we are trying to encode this constant relation with polynomials. So it increases the degree of the input polynomial, right? Yeah. Now, uh, another simple observation is that, so since we know that one is in the ideal if and only if P has no solution, then we can say the following, that whenever the CSP of CSP of AC is MP complete, then we get a co MP complete version of ideal membership problem. So if your CSP is difficult to solve, then IMP is also difficult. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about something more advanced like PP interpretability. So this notion of PP interpretability is basically what tells us that if we, sh we if we can use this algebras instead of relational structures. So can we just talk about algebras 
and their operations instead of relational structures or not. All right. We say this uh, structure A, PP interprets structure B if the base set and the predicates of B can be PP defined A. Don't bother about the definition, it's something completely vague. Just uh, so this PP is shortened for primitive positive. So basically, you can express mm, whatever you have in B using this uh, uh, relational structure that you have in A. So it turns out if you have this PP interpretability, then the problems are reduced close to each other, right? So if A PP interprets B, then ideal membership of uh, ideal membership of ship of <laughs> B is positively reduced to, to ideal membership of A, with uh, some blow up in the uh, degree. Okay. And this blow up is because uh, this A and B may, might have uh, like different domain scales that you have to capture. Them. Right. So as uh, so, since we have this uh, PP interpretability result, then this means we can use algebra. So we can replace this relational structure, put it aside, and talk about algebras and its operations. Okay. So IMP of algebra A denotes the class the class of problem IMP B, where B is a finite language invariant under the operation of this algebra. All right. Let me just. Uh, let me walk you through this. Uh, walk you through an example, right? So let's consider semi lattices, and we want to we want to uh, reduce the problem over semi lattices of uh, uh, over a domain of three elements to the Boolean case. Okay. So let's say A has base zero one two, and it's invariant on the semi lattice operation of this algebra A. And let's say the semi lattice operation is the following. Which we have where we have a global maximum, and basically zero is less than two, and one is less than two, and we don't have anything between zero and one, so it's not conservative in a sense. All right, so maximum of zero is zero and one is two. Okay, now consider this Boolean algebra B, and we have this instance curly B, and we want to reduce this problem, and in the in the algebra B, we have again the semi lattice uh, semi operation, which says, okay, zero is less than one. All right, so let's do the reduction. So we want to reduce IMP of A to IMP of B. Okay, so <clears throat> there is this result in like a universal algebra, which says if you have semi lattice polymorphism, then your uh, algebra is a sub algebra of this Boolean algebra to some powers. Okay. So basically, we have this mapping, which sends zero. Remember, the domain of A was zero, one, two, and the domain of B was zero, one. So we send zero to zero, one, one to one, zero, and two to one, one, naturally. So now we need to first transfer and transform an instance of CSP A into an instance of CSP B, and we know how to do it. So basically, we replace. So let's say we have this instance P of CSP A, and we want to construct this instance P star of CSP B. So we replace every variable x with a pair of variables x, x1 and x2. So this this is because we have this. Uh, this is because here in this uh, in this algebra we have zero, one, and one, two, and one, one. So for every variable, we need two variables, right? All right. So, and in every constraint, we replace the value a for x with g a for x one and x two. Okay. Now, and for the domain constraint, for every x, we add this constraint which says x one and x two has to take one of these values. All right. So the solutions of p are in one-to-one -one correspondence with solutions of p star. Okay. Now, since we have these instances p and p star, we can construct the corresponding ideals. And now we need to change the input ideal, input polynomial a little bit. Okay. So the, the, the mapping G that I talked about, we can always interpolate it with the polynomial of a constant degree, right? And the same holds for G inverse. We can uh, interpolate this G inverse, this mapping by a polynomial. 
So in this case, the polynomial is simple. So it takes x1 and x2 and gives you x1 plus x1 and x2, okay? So now the reduction is as follows. We have this instance t. We convert it to instance p star from the uh, Boolean algebras. And then we convert this poly input polynomial f to input polynomial f star. And how do we do that? Well, simply we replace every occurrence of x with g inverse of x1 and x2. Okay. Now we have this lemma which says, okay, if f is in the ideal of t, uh, so f is in the ideal of t, if and only if f star is in the ideal of t star. Okay, there we go. We have our uh, reduction, right? But uh, so this reduction works quite well in terms of decision version. But in the terms of search version, we don't know what's going on, right? So let's say I have defined a proof where f star is in the ideal of p star. So basically a proof like this. Uh, but can we recover a proof for f being inside p, ideal of p? This is uh, something interesting that we don't know yet. And uh, well, in terms of more polynomial cases, so as I, saw, as I said, we have this semi-lattice for every domain, but still we have this restriction on the degree and our results follows like by this result from universal algebra and the full time result in Boolean case. Then we have uh, that uh, the IMP of dual discriminator, uh, sort of a type of majority operation is polytime. So just remember for in the Boolean case, we had the, IMP of majority is polynomial time, but in Boolean case, the only majority polymorphism or operation that we have is dual discriminators. All right. So now we consider this dual discriminator for any fixed domain, and it turns out the problem is only time. So while well, some of the proof ideas, basically we have this geometric result about the dual discriminators, basically the variety of these dual discriminators. Uh, then, uh, well, we have three types of uh, constraints if we have dual discriminator, and it turns out this unit gain constraint, or sort of uh, this permutation constraint, cause a lot of trouble to construct Grobner bases. So what we do, we pre-process the instance, get rid of this unit gain constraints, and then we get the Grobner bases after that. It's easier to get the Grobner bases after that, right? And once again, we don't have this degree restriction for that dual discriminators, right? Or another case, which is like the most difficult one is that, so for Booleans, we have this polynomial time. Now we want to consider that P, where P is a prime. So IMPD that P is polytime solvable. And here again, we construct this Grobner basis for this uh, sort of, we construct this truncated Grobner braces, which where we only go up to degree D where, when we are constructing the, this Grobner brace. Right, it's a, it's a long proof and uh, yeah, so I think we can talk about it after the talk if someone is interested. Uh, let me finish up with some open questions. Well, obviously, what are the more, um, what are more polynomial cases? Then the second interesting question is, uh, what is the connection that uh, this problem IMP has to some standard CSP technique? For instance, consistency, right? Well, we know that uh, this local consistency stuff are uh, basically thing and so on, our consistency solves all these, all these bounded degree CSPs, right? But why cannot we have something like this for the IMP? Or basically this consistency, what does it mean in terms of IMP? That's, uh, the third interesting question would be like proof recovery. Just uh, as I told you in terms of semi-lattices, we can have this reduction, which works beautifully in terms of uh, decision version, but in terms of proof recovery, we don't know what's going on there. And then uh, we saw this low degree restriction. For instance, for semi-lattices, we have like this degree this restriction, but for majorities, we don't have it. So why do they correspond to? Right. So by the way, if you want to have dual discriminators for uh, uh, on ternary domains, and if you want the like, full Grobner basis, 
then you don't have degree two. You have to go to degree three. So there is something interesting going on there. And the last thing that I didn't talk much about it, this is this like Bookberger's algorithm. This is the, the, this general algorithm to construct Grobner bases. So this algorithm uses uh, this notion of S polynomial. Well, if you're interested, we can talk about it later, but uh, it's really interesting to see what this S polynomial correspond to in terms of CFD, right? So somehow in the dual discriminator case, if we do this pre-processing and get rid of this unique game, uh, unique game uh, constraint, then we don't need to compute this S polynomials anymore. So this uh, Buchberger's algorithm becomes polynomial. Yeah. So thank you for listening, and please ask questions if you have any. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Akbar, for a very nice thank talk. You. Thank there you. There are some questions, comments. Hi, this is uh, Fida. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Ah, so I, I'm not sure whether I, I caught that correctly. Do you know uh, for uh, general IMPs if you have a majority polymorphism, whether that's tractable then? Uh, what do you mean, general IMP? So I think for if, if uh, uh, the Boolean case. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. I, I think I understood the question. So, uh, but for for bigger domains. Right. So for general majority, we don't know anything yet. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So this dual discriminator is a sort of a special type of majority operation, right? right? So we know everything for this dual discriminator, but for majority, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Like. Uh, beyond bullying, what is going on, we don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like uh, uh, super interesting because uh, we have this bounded degree con uh, restriction for the semi-lattices, well, at least in Boolean case, but we don't have this such a restriction for majority. Well, but uh, no, never mind, because majority in Boolean case is just dual discriminator. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so to answer your question, we don't know anything, yeah. Mm -hmm. more questions yeah so if i may just uh, like do do you know anything on top of these like some concrete examples what i mean is this uh, say this three element two similarities or say product of two z2s or z4 right so that's a really interesting question so well uh well we can get the so actually this is what we are working on so this we can get the this uh, sort of uh, multi-sorted CSP, we can have uh, like a uh, result for multi-sorted CSP. And uh, in like, in terms of, uh, so, so basically the next step beyond this linear equation, mod P is basically linear equations in abelian groups, right? When we have this fundamental mm -hmm. theorem of uh, abelian groups, so we can write it as a direct sum of, uh, uh, direct sum of these P groups. So, and, and over there, we need this multiplication z2 times z2, right? So, uh, for the decision version, it seems we can do it, right? But uh, for the search version, we don't know. So, even like uh, not, not just z2 square, but z4 is doable. So, all abelian groups. Yeah, but decision version. So, there is a like a really solid point there. Yeah, the decision version seems to be okay. So hopefully even abelian group. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But uh, as, uh, as far as I understand, this multi-sorted stuff should work well because uh, each, each variable has its own domain and then in the construction of these ideals, we shouldn't face any like major problem. But Some more questions?
Okay. I guess so, so maybe if, if, or if, or like it's maybe hard to answer, but so uh, this ideal membership is harder in general than the CS people one. So somehow what uh, does it tell us uh, the tractability of IM, IMP? Does it tell us something more uh, in terms of CSP? I mean, can you formulate, you know, if you can solve IMP, then you can do this and this with your CSP instances, not only decide, but, you know, have something. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, so, so well, I guess I know what you mean. So, uh this basically this imp is a sort of generalization so this so if you want to do refutation refutation of csp instances is basically membership of one in the ideal right so but uh in in the like general setting we don't so the input polynomial doesn't have to be one it can be of any degree right yes, yes. so in that sense it's more general than csp and uh, mm, uh did it answer your question or? Did well, you yeah, I, I, yeah, I know this. Uh, so so yeah. it's more general, but whether you, you, if you can solve the general problem, does it give us anything about the CSP, you know, which you can formulate in terms of CSP? That's somehow not only you can decide instances, but you can do this and this. Uh, uh, honestly, I don't know. So, well, mm -hmm. honestly, like, I don't know anything about that because uh, so well we don't know even what is this consistency mean in terms of ideal membership problem right mm. so well I don't know probably it means something but <laughs> uh, we are far from knowing such a thing right yeah thanks mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, so last chance for questions. So maybe I have another one uh, then. Uh, yeah. So when you when you uh, got the uh, tractability result for IMP, was it always by using Gröbner basis or did you have any alternative approach? Right. As well? So, well, it depends if you want to work in for the search version or the decision version. So. As I said, for the decision version, you don't need to compute uh, the Scrobner basis. It's not necessarily needed. So what you can do is just uh, for the decision version, you find the satisfying assignment to your instance, which is a non-zero of the input polynomial. If you find such a satisfying assignment, then you are done. You can say the polynomial is not in the idea, right? Without using any Grobner basis. Mm -hmm. But for the search version, Unfortunately, we don't know any other approaches other than Grobner basis, right? So, it's, so the, the, it comes to how do you do this polynomial division, right? If you don't have a Grobner basis, then it's not well behaved. Maybe, I don't know, maybe there are some other notions of a good basis other than Grobner basis, but I'm not aware of them. Yeah, so just in summary, for the decision version, you can get around with a Grobner basis. But for search version, I don't know. For the search ver version, you mean you want a, a kind of Nullstellensatz proof? For... Yeah, so in the search version, like you say, okay, F is in the ideal. So mm -hmm. prove it, give me a witness. Mm -hmm. Okay, I give you this sum, which is mm -hmm. sum of these polynomials. There you go. This is your equality. 